Hello guys and welcome back. If you are and you're around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering another solved case. Perhaps one of Australia's biggest and most well-known cases internationally and that is the Peter Falconio and Joanne Lees case. A documentary was released several months back that really reignited the conversation about this almost 20 year old case. So I thought it would be a good time to discuss it here and lay out everything that we know to date. This case was certainly one of the first big cases that I became familiar with as a child growing up in Australia. I think it was one of those cases that really instilled fear into Aussies about driving alone in the outback. The idea that you just don't know who or what is out there. And then of course we have the movie Wolf Creek that was released just a few years after this case that really played on the fears of the public. Wolf Creek was apparently loosely based on today's case along with the Ivan Milat backpacker killings case. Although I definitely read some mixed opinions on whether this was true or not. And a quick disclaimer, today's video, although long I assume, is well and truly the condensed down version of events. You could honestly spend hours and hours discussing and analysing this case. With so many ideas, theories and versions of events, it did get a little confusing but as always I encourage you to do your own research and check out the resources that I have linked down below for you that I used. But having said all of that, let's get into today's case. So as always, I do like to start by talking about the victims. The victims being Peter Falconio and Joanne Lees. Depending on whose versions of events that you believe. Some believe one is a victim, some believe neither are, and some believe the killer currently sitting in jail has been the victim all along. This case, especially now with the new documentary, has a lot of controversy surrounding it. But really from the day this crime occurred, there has been doubts and questions over what really happened and who really did it. Today's video, however, is not to present to you my personal thoughts or opinions, but what happened, the facts, and allow you to form your own opinion, which we can all respectfully share down below in the comments. Keyword here, respectfully. <laughs> I know there are a lot of heated opinions out there on this case, but let's just remember to be nice, okay? Okay. <laughs> Peter Marco Falconio was born on September the 20th, 1972, in the small village of Hepworth in West Yorkshire, England, to his parents, Joan and Luciano Falconio. He was the third Falconio son born, out of what would be a total of four Falconio boys. Joanne Rachel Lees was born on September the 25th, 1973, in the town of Huddersfield, West Yorkshire, England, so pretty darn close to where Peter was born. Joanne's parents separated when she was young, so she was raised by her mother Jenny, until Joanne was about 11 years old when her mother remarried a man named Vincent. This marriage also gave Joanne a brother named Sam. Joanne went through several jobs throughout high school and in her early adult years, including a barmaid, a bacon packer and a travel agent. In 1996, when Joanne was 23 and Peter was 24, the pair met at a nightclub in Huddersfield. A relationship developed and by the following year, 1997, the couple were living together in Brighton. They chose Brighton because this was where Peter was studying, at the Brighton University. Joanne, who worked for the Thomas Cook Travel Agency, transferred to their Brighton office so she could continue to work as a travel agent as it was a job that she thoroughly enjoyed. Joanne and Peter, who both loved to travel, also went on their first major holiday this year together. They embarked on a short holiday to Italy, Greece and Jamaica before returning to Brighton to continue work and study. But after getting a taste of travel together, the pair started planning a massive backpacking trip to Australia together for the very near future. However, their families were not too keen on the idea of them travelling to Australia, given the recent Ivan Milat backpacker killings that had taken place. But despite their family's concerns, on November the 15th, 2000, the pair set off for their next adventure. They travelled through Nepal, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and Cambodia before landing in Sydney, Australia, 16 days into the new year, 2001, where they planned to stay for the next several months. 
As they were both traveling on a working holiday visa, they quickly set out about finding work. Joanne eventually secured a job at a bookstore called Dimix in the Sydney CBD, Dimix being a chain of bookstores here in Australia, and Peter found work installing office furniture. The couple really fell in love with Sydney and Joanne was reluctant to move on, but Peter was getting pretty keen for the next adventure. Joanne really did love her job and the couple had both made a bunch of new friends and they were really enjoying the nightlife and partying and Joanne maybe was partying a little bit more than Peter, but regardless, they were both having an amazing time. However, Joanne did eventually agree it was time to pack up and move on to their next destination. So Peter set off looking for the perfect road trip vehicle. From the outside, this holiday probably looks like the trip of a lifetime so far, right? Well, it had been, aside from one or two hiccups along the way. Back in Cambodia, Joanne had her traveler's checks and her plane ticket stolen. However, another fellow backpacker very kindly offered to cover the stolen costs, which I think is incredibly generous. And Peter and Joanne did, of course, pay them back. Then, during their time in Sydney, Joanne cheated on Peter. Joanne had become friends with another English backpacker named Nick Riley through one of her work colleagues that brought Nick along on one of their nights out. The pair spent several months flirting before, in Joanne's words, things went too far and I let it happen. According to Joanne, herself and Nick slept together twice before she ended the affair, although she never ended up confessing any of this to Peter. I'll come back to this a bit later as it does impact future events, but for now, let's discuss the next portion of Joanna Peter's Aussie holiday. Before departing Sydney, Peter purchased a 30-year-old orange Volkswagen T2 Combi camper van for $1,800, which Joanne was apparently not too much of a fan of as it couldn't even get past 80 k's an hour or 50 miles, but Joanne eventually warmed up to the cute little Combi. Well, it's, it's cute in my opinion anyway. <laughs> as it had amenities at the back, such as a fridge, kitchen, and a place to rest, which was pretty convenient for a couple that were about to embark on a road trip. On June 25, 2001, Joanne and Peter set off on their road trip, which included visits to Canberra, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Brisbane. So let's fast forward about three weeks. Peter and Joanne had reached the Northern Territory, and one of the first things that they were keen to do was the popular tourist activity, I guess, of Climbing Airs Rock, also known by its original name of Uluru. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how famous Airs Rock is outside of Australia, but here in Oz, the big red rock that sits smack bang in the middle of the country is pretty darn well known. I also think it may hold the title as the world's largest rock, but uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> And the rock's climb is actually a pretty challenging and dangerous one too, with over 30 deaths occurring there. Although just last year, they put a stop to people climbing Ayers Rock, as the rock is considered a sacred place by the traditional owners of the land, the Anangu people. And I looked up how to pronounce this and I couldn't find anywhere that was exactly the same. So I'm really sorry if I've offended anybody by mispronouncing it. I will pop, pop the uh, spelling on the screen now. So the Anangu people had actually been requesting people to stop climbing the rock since the early 1990s, but put a permanent close to it in October of 2019. That's my very basic understanding of Ayers Rock's history anyway, but feel free to correct me in the comments below if any of that is incorrect, and definitely do some of your own research, as Ayers Rock has an incredibly interesting history. So after Uluru, Joanne and Peter headed to Alice Springs for a couple of days, which is a few hours drive from Uluru, but still in the Northern Territory. Saturday, July the 14th was their last day in Alice Springs, and this day started out pretty much like any other. The pair ran a few separate errands. Peter visited an accountant where he found out he owed the tax department a little bit of money because he had been paying taxes as an Aussie resident as opposed to a UK one, so maybe not the best start to Peter's day. And Joanne just went to the library to check her emails before herself and Peter met up for breakfast at a place called the Green Frog Cafe. After this, they made a stop off for a few hours to watch the annual Camel Cup, which is still in Alice Springs. And the Camel Cup is basically a race, like a horse race, but you guessed it, 
with camels. <laughs> they stayed to watch the Miss Camel Cup beauty pageant, which certainly sounds interesting, before grabbing some takeaway food at Red Rooster. Um, by the way, do other countries have Red Rooster or is it just us here in Australia? And a warning, if you are ever visiting us in Australia, their food is trash. Don't recommend. Zero out of ten. But anyway, after this, Giant and Peter began the long drive to their next destination called Devil's Marbles, also known by its local Aboriginal term of Kalu Kalu. And according to Google Maps, Devil's Marbles is about a four hour drive from Alice Springs. By this point in the day, it was getting a little bit late to start such a long drive, and apparently Joanne wasn't much of a fan of night driving. But regardless, the pair continued on with their journey up the Stuart Highway, and the Stuart Highway, by the way, is one of Australia's major highways running all the way from the top of Australia in Darwin to the bottom of Australia in Port Augusta. Although the locals do simply call it the track. They started off the first leg with Peter driving before swapping out for a bit so Peter could have a bit of a break, a read and a nap. At around 6.20pm, they stopped off at a place called Tea Tree to purchase fuel, buy some lollies and share a joint as they watched the sunset over their long day. At this point, they were two hours into their drive, Tea Tree being about the halfway mark of their journey. After this pit stop, Peter took over driving again, and not long after this, the couple actually saw a small roadside fire. Peter had wanted to stop to investigate it, but Joanne told him she felt scared that it was some sort of trap, so they continued on. And I don't exactly know why she thought a roadside fire would be a trap, but if she was a nervous night driver, possibly anything that was out of the ordinary simply made her nervous. Anyway, they spotted several more small fires up ahead, but drove past all of them without stopping. And I'm just going to add in here, as a general rule, driving at night in these areas is not really recommended. It's dark, it's desolate, and it's dangerous. Even more dangerous if you're in a vehicle that may not be the fastest or the most reliable. And despite being in a warmer part of the country, being the desert, the overnight temperatures can drop down pretty low. On that particular night, it was 11 degrees Celsius or 51 Fahrenheit. And it was actually winter time in Australia when they were visiting, but Alice Springs day temperatures remain in the 30s Celsius or uh, in the high 80s Fahrenheit, I believe. But it does drop by more than half overnight. I feel like I'm always throwing in these useless, random Australian facts into my videos. But hey, we're an Australian true crime channel here. If I didn't tell you a bit about Australia, I feel like I'd be doing you a major disservice. Uh, but let me know down below if you just like hearing random facts about Australia or if you just don't care. But anyway, as I said before, Joanne wasn't keen to be driving at night, so I'm not sure what made them continue on. I guess they were just keen to get to the, ne the next destination and just get settled in. As night fell, Peter and Joanne continued on to Devil's Marbles, passing through the small town of Barrow Creek on their way. And this was hour three of their four hour journey. And with the time being around 7.30pm, they were set to reach their destination at roughly 830 not long after passing by Barrow Creek, they noticed a white Toyota four-wheel drive of what they thought to be a Land Cruiser model with a green canopy on the back driving behind them. Considering the time of night and their location, it was pretty rare to see someone out on the road as well. They expected the four-wheel drive to overtake them because their little older combi could barely reach 80 k's an hour, but at around 8 p.m., the four-wheel driver actually pulled up beside them and the driver began making gestures for them to pull over and shouting things, only two words of which Peter and Joanne could make out, sparks and exhaust. So they pulled over on the side of the road and the four-wheel drive pulled up behind them. An Australian man with a drooping moustache, a checkered flannelette shirt and a baseball cap emerged from the vehicle and told them that he had seen sparks shooting out from their exhaust. So Peter got out of the vehicle to investigate what was going on as Joanne slid over to the driver's side at Peter's request so she could rev the engine. 
Moments later, Joanne heard a loud bang. Assuming the revving had caused the exhaust to backfire, she turned around to see what was going on. However, before Joanne could work out what had happened, she was confronted at the window by the unknown man holding a gun to her head, telling her to move over. Joanne froze in fear and was unable to move. So the man pushed her over to the passenger seat where he yelled at her to put her head between her knees and her hands behind her back. He then proceeded to place some homemade handcuffs over her wrists that were made up of cable ties and masking tape. The man then pushed Joanne out of the vehicle and onto the harsh gravel road where he straddled her and attempted to secure her feet together with duct tape and also placed duct tape over her mouth. But Joanne thrashed about so much that the man was unable to properly restrain her and gave up. After this, she was left with duct tape caught in her hair and loosely around her ankles. And then, according to Joanne, the unknown man, likely in a fit of rage, punched her in the temple before placing a canvas bag over her head to prevent her to see what was going on. But with Joanne wriggling about so much, the canvas bag was quick to slip off her head. The next thing Joanne knew, she was in the front seat of the man's four-wheel drive and being shoved into the back between the two front seats. Although this detail of her story would later change, but I will get into that later. So Joanne had fallen onto her stomach on a mattress that was placed in the back of the, of the ute area, but managed to flip herself onto her back. And it wasn't long before Joanne noticed that she was not alone in the vehicle. Sitting in the front seat on a cushion was a rather chunky speckled dog, which Joanne thought to be a Dalmatian or possibly a blue healer. The dog just sat there, however, not barking or even really reacting to the situation. As Joanne lay there, terrified of being sexually assaulted or worse, she tried to listen out to see what was going on outside. At one point, she called out for Peter, but the man told her to shut up. She then heard the sound of something being dragged across the gravel. Then, momentary silence. Joanne took this as her opportunity to very quickly and quietly slip out of the side of the canopy and run for her life, straight into the very pitch black and terrifying bushland on the side of the road. And although I'm sure this was an incredibly scary thing to do, it probably beat the idea of facing the man that was going to do God knows what to her. Joanne tripped over several times as she looked for a place to hide, but it wasn't long before she heard the man come look for her. So she ducked down as low as she could with her hands still tied behind her back with the makeshift handcuffs. She attempted to breathe as quietly as she could as the man who was with his dog shone the flashlight into the bush. The man would pass by Joanne three times before giving up, or so she thought. He then walked back to his vehicle with his dog and started up the engine. Finally, Joanne thought he was going to leave her alone, but instead he reversed his car to face the bushland and put on his high beams, shining the bright light right over her. She crouched down as low as she could possibly crouch undiscovered, and not long after this, the man drove away for good. This entire time, Joanne had been just 35 metres or 114 feet from the roadside. And I must say, Joanne got bloody lucky. Considering the silence of the desolate outback, anything could have given her away, her breathing or a single snap of a branch. But nothing was ever heard by the man or his dog. A little while after this, as Joanne sat in hiding, she managed to get her tied up hands from her back to her front, stepping through them with her legs, which by the way, is incredibly difficult. So I have no idea how she managed to do this. Then using a lip balm that she had in her pocket, she attempted to grease up her palms and slip the handcuffs off, but she was unsuccessful. And not only was Joanne likely a very cold out there, she was also dressed completely inappropriately for the bushland conditions. 
She had on only a t-shirt, shorts down to her knees and some sandals. Of course, it's not like Joanne knew what was going to happen, so it's not like she could have dressed appropriately if she had wanted to. After five hours of hiding in Australian bushland, at 12.35am, Joanne emerged, hoping it was safe for her to flag down the next passing motorist. She saw lights in the distance and as it got closer, she realized the vehicle was a road train. Banking on the fact that this would not be her attacker, as the road train got closer, she jumped out in front of it and wildly waved her arms about. The startled and very confused driver slammed down on his brakes, stopping about a mile up the road. The driver, named Vince Miller, initially thought he'd hit the girl that he had just seen, so he got out of the vehicle to investigate. Taking his torch, he looked around under the road train before hearing a faint scuffling sound. He yelled out for whatever or whoever was making that sound to reveal themselves, and moments later, out of nowhere flies a terrified young girl with makeshift cuffs around her wrists and duct tape stuck to her hair. At this point, Vince's co-drivers also emerged from the vehicle to investigate why they had just stopped, and they are just as surprised as Vince is to see a disheveled young girl out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. The first thing the three men do is attempt to remove the cable tie handcuffs from the girl's wrists with some tools they have in their vehicle and one of the men actually decides that they'll just hold on to these handcuffs just in case there's any kind of investigation and they need them as evidence. Little did the three men know just how massive this criminal investigation was about to become. Once Joanne calmed down a little, she told the men her name was Joanne Lees and her boyfriend Peter Falconio was missing. She briefly ran them through the story of what had happened before telling them that they needed to help her find Peter. The men agreed to help. That was until Joanne mentioned there was a gun involved and at this point they decided the safest and most logical option was to call the police. The men were probably also scared to hear the word gun because the Port Arthur Massacre was not such a distant memory at this point in Australia's history. And if you've never heard of the Port Arthur incident, it's definitely worth looking into. I would like to cover it on this channel. It's just a really big controversial case. But if you would like me to cover it, let me know down below and I can definitely start looking into it. So the road train drove to Barrow Creek to make the call to the police and help Joanne calm down a little. At 1.30am, the phone call was made to the Alice Springs Police. As Alice Springs was about three hours from Barrow Creek, it would take them roughly three hours to get there. And at 4.20am, the police did arrive. I think there were some more local police from Tea Tree that arrived first, but given the severity of the crime that was reported, I assume they probably wanted to send out some more experienced or specialised police officers. Also, given that it was the middle of the night, it's likely little could have been achieved until sunrise. So the first thing police did upon arrival was take witness testimonies and collect evidence. One thing that several of the officers noticed was the condition of Joanne Lees. I'll insert a photo so you can get a better visual, but for someone that had been attacked and then ran through the Australian bush, with pretty minimal protective clothing, she looked remarkably good. She had a few cuts and bruises, but nothing life-threatening. However, if you look at Joanne's facial expression, she definitely looks like someone that had just endured some sort of traumatic event. She looks stunned, shocked, and a little scared. By the way, I'm not saying this to imply Joanne was lying. These are just observations that were made that I am relaying to you. So as soon as it was light outside, the police began their search for Peter Falconio and the gunman. When police arrived at the location where the crime took place, they found Joanne and Peter's orange combi parked about 80 metres or 260-ish feet into the bushland and a pool of blood by the roadside covered in dirt. 
Testing of this blood would later find it belonged to Peter Falconio. Police also ordered dozens of roadblocks to be put in place that morning, preventing people from exiting the immediate areas. A few days later, Aboriginal trackers arrived to assist in the investigation, but strangely, all they were able to find were footprints belonging to Joanne Lees. The footprints of her attacker, Peter, and even the attacker's dog could not be located. Little more evidence was ever located at the crime scene, except for Joanne's lip balm and some duct tape some weeks later. Although when these new bits of evidence were found, people began to question if the investigators had been thorough enough in their initial search of the crime scene. Besides these items, the pool of blood, Joanne's Footprints, Joanne's clothing and the cable ties held onto by the road train drivers, investigators had very little to go off. Except, of course, the word of Joanne Lees, the one and only witness to the crime. Unfortunately, her memory of the events of that night were a little shaky, but given the trauma she endured, I suppose it's expected that her version of events may change or evolve. Unbelievably, just four days after Joanne's ordeal, police made her basically do a reenactment of her attack at the actual crime scene using similar vehicles to the combi and the four-wheel drive. And to me, first off, I hope that this would never happen today. For a victim to have to reenact what happened to them days, days after the crime, I can't imagine what this would do to a person. Joanne's only stipulation for this reenactment was that the media were not allowed to be present, much to their dismay. And speaking of the media, let's discuss their role in this case and how this case was publicly handled. This is one of those cases here in Australia that has become really infamous. It's as well known as the Ivan Milat the backpacker killings or the Dingo took my baby, ate my baby, whatever the saying is, Azaria Chamberlain case. So as soon as the media got wind of the Lees and Falconio case, which was pretty much only hours after the crime occurred, they started reporting on it and on Joanne non-stop. After all, from the view of the media, this was a fantastic story. A pretty young girl, a British backpacker, on the holiday of a lifetime with her boyfriend, and she manages to free herself from a presumed killer, a monster lurking in Outback Australia with his gun. It was the story of a survivor. But then there's also the burning question of what happened to her boyfriend, Peter Falconio? As you can imagine, the public had also developed an intense interest in this case. But the survivor title that Joanne was given didn't last too long, as the public and the media quickly began to question her story, much like the Azaria and Lindy Chamberlain case years earlier. Not only did parts of Joanne's story not really add up, but publicly, Joanne seemed cold and distant, not what people wanted to see from a victim or a mourning girlfriend. And she would rarely talk to the media, but when she did, or should I say when she was forced to by some sort of media or PR team, she sounded emotionless. At one of the few press conferences that she agreed to do at the time, which was barely even a press conference, she answered only a few pre-prepared questions in a room where she would only allow a small handful of journalists. But that was not what got people talking about this particular press conference. It was her attire. Talking about slash judging what women wear in the media, not much has changed, has it? Anyway, although her hair and makeup were immaculate this day, she chose to wear a pink sleeveless top that said cheeky monkey across the chest. She was advised not to wear it, but wore it regardless. And the public and the media tore her to shreds over this, labeling the attire inappropriate. And that was one of the nicer descriptions. At another press conference, Joanne also spoke of how much she disliked and distrusted the media, blaming them for twisting her story and making her out to be a liar. But unfortunately, telling the media how much you don't like them when they're the ones reporting on you is not going to do you any favours. She stated at this press conference, 
Anyone that has spoken to me or been in contact with me, no one doubts me. It's only the media that questions my story. I've got a problem with all press that distort the truth and doubt my story, misquote me, and um, making up false accusations and stories. After this, Joanne very quickly went from a brave survivor who had just lost her boyfriend to the stuck-up British tourist that was probably involved with her boyfriend's disappearance. However, I really don't think we can judge someone based on their reaction in public. The media and the public are very critical when it comes to analysing the emotions of those close to a victim. Everyone's an expert, right? But no two people are ever going to have the exact same reaction to trauma or public scrutiny and what is the correct way to react anyway? You could cry and be accused of having crocodile tears, or you could remain quiet and be accused of being cold and distant. How can anyone possibly win in a situation like this? And if you are familiar with the Lindy Chamberlain, Azaria Chamberlain case, you will know this is very reminiscent of how Lindy Chamberlain was treated. Like, very very reminiscent of it. Anyway, Joanne did eventually return to the UK, but would be back in Australia soon enough. As the investigation went on, a few more pieces of evidence were uncovered. So let's go through a few of those now. On the shirt that Joanne was wearing on the night of her attack, a very small trace of male DNA was detected, as well as a tiny speckle of blood. Very small traces of DNA were also found on the homemade handcuffs, as well as the combi's gear stick and steering wheel that matched up with the DNA found on Joanne's shirt. The last thing worth mentioning is the CCTV footage from the night of the crime, but I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. First, let's discuss a few of the inconsistencies in the case. And to clarify, again, I'm not taking any sides, I'm just presenting the facts. You can form your own opinion on Joanne and her involvement or lack thereof. So going back to the shirt Joanne was wearing, as I mentioned, only a tiny trace of male DNA was found on it and a tiny speck of blood. Considering the amount of physical contact Joanne said she had with her attacker, this seems kind of odd. The recent documentary definitely goes into more detail on this point, so check it out if you're after a far, a far more, uh, I can't talk today, a far more detailed explanation. Then there's the affair that I spoke about earlier between Joanne and her friend, friend, Nick. As I said, she never told Peter about the affair, which I guess is irrelevant now, but more importantly, she never told the police, labelling it irrelevant information. But even so, if this truly had nothing to do with the crime, would you not just tell police everything, just to lay everything out on the table, get it out in the open and out of the way? After all, you don't want investigators wasting their time on looking at you if you have nothing to hide. And unsurprisingly, keeping this information a secret from investigators really did Joanne no favours. But what's worse is she continued to email Nick after Peter's disappearance and in an attempt to hide the emails from investigators who were watching her every move, she gave Nick the code name of Steph. When police questioned Joanne about Steph, she basically told them it was her own private business and irrelevant to the investigation. Oh, and uh, she also made plans to meet up with Nick in the future, so there's that. But again, I, I get the feeling Joanne was an incredibly private person and who knows, who honestly knows what she was thinking on this point. We then have the footprints at the crime scene or lack thereof. Only Joanne's footprints were ever found at the scene, but if her attacker and his dog had been walking through the bushland to find her, there should have been two sets of prints, plus some paw prints. But between the investigators and the Aboriginal trackers, 
no one could find a second set of footprints. Joanne also had trouble keeping consistent when it came to certain details, such as what the perpetrator looked like, the type of vehicle he had, and the breed of dog he owned. As you can imagine, these inconsistencies were very, very frustrating for investigators because this was the kind of key information they needed to solve this case. Without a clear composite sketch of the perpetrator's face, a particular car model, or even a dog breed, what information could investigators relay to the public that would help them solve this case. And on top of that, Joanne's description of the perpetrator was incredibly general. A middle-aged man with a checkered shirt and a droopy moustache with some grey scattered through it. So pretty much half the males that live in the Northern Territory. Nothing she remembered about him had been distinctive, such as a mole, a scar, a tattoo, etc. However, and again I will say, going through a traumatic event can mess with your memory, make you remember things, forget things. Not that I'm an expert in trauma in any way, clearly, but this is my best guess as to why she had difficulties with details. So despite the lack of information and evidence, a $250,000 reward was put on offer to the public to anyone that had any information leading to an arrest. And at this point, given the amount of publicity this case had received, worldwide for that matter, not just in Australia, investigators were getting pretty desperate to get this case solved. The final piece of evidence that investigators had obtained was CCTV footage from a petrol station or a gas station for my American friends. Do you guys even call it a gas station? I actually don't know. <laughs> Let me know down below. Anyway, the CCTV was from a Shell petrol station in Alice Springs, showing a man that vaguely resembled Joanne's description of her attacker. The man, who had a droopy moustache and was wearing a cap, jumper and pants, entered the petrol station just after midnight on June 15 hours after the crime had occurred. The man's vehicle also happened to resemble the vehicle that Joanne had described to the police, a Toyota Land Cruiser with a canopy on the back. Even though Joanne's description of both her attacker and his vehicle had been vague and inconsistent, police released the CCTV footage to the public in hopes that the person in the footage would come forward and they could be cleared but when this did not happen, they began to look into all the registered owners in that area of the 1991 to 1999 model Toyota Land Cruiser four-wheel drive with a canopy on the back. Investigators were also desperately looking for this car model that allowed access between the two front seats into the back area or the back U area, the way in which Joanne said that she was forced into the back, but they were unsuccessful in finding one. So after the CCTV was released, several members of the public phoned in, telling police they thought they recognised the man in the footage. In total, 36 men were named and investigated. One of these men was Bradley John Murdoch. So let's very briefly go over who Bradley John Murdoch was. Born in 1958 in Geraldton, Western Australia, Murdoch got involved with the wrong crowd pretty early on in his life and eventually became a drug runner, transporting drugs between towns in Western Australia South Australia and the Northern Territory. His day job, however, was a truck driver and a mechanic. In 1995, he served a 15-month prison sentence for shooting at people while he was drunk. And Murdoch also happened to be the owner of a Toyota Land Cruiser four-wheel drive with a canopy on the back and was the owner of a speckled crossbreed Dalmatian named Jack. In November of 2001, police interviewed Murdoch up in Broome, Western Australia, but they did not believe he was connected to the Falconio and Lee's case, and they moved on. But at this point, the investigation had over 2,500 persons of interest, so Murdoch would have just been a little blip in their radar. The following year, the name Bradley Murdoch came up once again. In May of 2002, a drug runner named James Tahi Hepi was arrested and charged, and in exchange for a lighter sentence, Hepi told police he had information on the Falconio case. He named his previous drug runner accomplice, Bradley Murdoch, as the man they were looking for. 
He told police he had witnessed Murdoch making homemade handcuffs out of cable ties and duct tape, very similar to those used to restrain Joanne. Police then decided it was time to collect a DNA sample from Murdoch's brother, Gary, to see if it matched up with the DNA evidence that they already had. Turns out it was a match. So police decided it was time to make an arrest. Only problem was, Bradley Murdoch was nowhere to be found. But it was not too long before he resurfaced. In August of that same year, Murdoch was arrested and tried in South Australia on an unrelated kidnapping and assault charge, for which he was found not guilty. And meanwhile, Joanne was asked to pick out her attacker from a series of police photographs and she picked out Bradley Murdoch. The only problem with this is that Murdoch's face had actually been in some online articles as a person of interest in the Falconio case just months earlier. So there was no real way to be sure that Joanne had not seen these images and unintentionally remembered Murdoch's face. After this, Murdoch was extradited to the Northern Territory to be charged with the murder of Peter Falconio and the assault and attempted kidnapping of Joanne Lees. The trial, a trial by jury, began on October 17, 2005 in Darwin Supreme Court, where Murdoch pled not guilty to all charges. In court, Joanne once again identified Murdoch as her attacker. So let's briefly go through all the main evidence that was presented in this case. There was the CCTV footage, footage that Murdoch says was not him, then there was Murdoch's four-wheel drive being a very similar match to Joanne's description and to the CCTV footage. And of course, Murdoch's DNA was found on Joanne's shirt, the cable ties and the combi's gear stick. And when Murdoch's vehicle and home were searched, investigators found various lengths of cable ties similar to those used on the makeshift handcuffs as well as rolls of tape, night vision goggles, and other various kind of unusual items. Also, wrapped around Murdoch's gun holster was a black hair tie. A hair tie that every source I read says was Joanne Lee's. However, from my understanding, although Joanne said that she lost a black hair tie the night of the attack, there was no DNA present on this tie to prove it ever belonged to Joanne. So take this evidence for what you will. Another interesting thing that happened during the trial was that Joanne changed part of her story. She changed her explanation as to how Murdoch got her into the back of his four-wheel drive. She initially said that she was put in the front of the vehicle and forced into the back between the two seats. But during the trial, she said, quote, I have had time to reflect on my initial statement and I remember landing in the rear of the vehicle on my stomach. It's possible he may have pushed me through the side of the canvas, end quote. Now, this revelation is significant because, as I mentioned before, investigators discovered there were no models of Toyota Land Cruiser four-wheel drives that allowed front to back access. In fact, they had actually spent a lot of time and money looking for this particular car model with the front to back access. In court, however, it appears that Joanne's explanation as to her lapse of memory was accepted. Uh, by the way, my neighbors are having a party. It's Saturday evening, so if you can hear them, I am so sorry. And I do just want to put a brief reminder here that what I just mentioned is a really brief overview of the evidence. If I went through the entire trial, that would be an entire video in itself. But anyway, on December 13, 2005, Bradley Murdoch was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with a non-parole period of 28 years. The following year, Murdoch appealed his sentence, but was dismissed. Again in 2007, he applied for special leave to appeal, but was refused. And if you're wondering what special leave to appeal is, so am I. I looked it up and I don't get it. <laughs> if you're a lawyer or anyone, any type of person working in the field of law, please explain to me down below what this means. <laughs> but anyway, in 2013, he launched another appeal, but his lawyers withdrew it the following year. 
There was also rumours going around that Murdoch would reveal where Peter Falconio's body was in exchange for being transferred to a prison in Western Australia, but as of yet, this has not happened, and to this day, Peter Falconio remains missing, presumed deceased, and Murdoch is still sitting in his jail cell. So let's very briefly touch on what Giant Lees has been up to since the events of that night. After attending the trial, she returned to England, but remains somewhat of a household name here in Australia. She has kept a relatively low profile, but has done the odd interview here and there, including an interview with British journalist Martin Bashir, for which her appearance received pretty mixed reviews, and she appeared on Enough Rope with Andrew Denton. In 2006, she released a book about her life called No Turning Back. I've heard varying dollar amounts in regards to the events that Joanne received on this book, some as high as half a million Australian dollars. As far as I could see in my research, Joanne has never been married, had kids, and if she's ever been in a serious relationship, she has never made it public. But again, I think she is a pretty private person. So I want to spend the last portion of this video discussing the recent documentary Murder in the Outback, The Falconio and Lee's Mystery. I'm going to run through the main theories discussed and how they challenge aspects of this case. So in the documentary, the DNA evidence is put into question. There were apparently only very small levels of DNA from multiple people found on the combi's gear stick and the handcuffs, and being that there were multiple people's DNA found, it made it hard to identify each person's individual DNA, and even be 100% certain of the DNA that was found. Then there's also the fact that it was revealed that the makeshift handcuffs may have been contaminated when a police superintendent took them to the jail that Murdoch was being held in and brought them into the same room that he was being interviewed in, which why would you do that? <laughs> the documentary also discussed the theory that Murdoch's DNA may have transferred onto Joanne Lee's shirt at a different location, especially given how little DNA was found. And that was Red Rooster. You may remember me mentioning Joanna Peter visited Red Rooster to grab some takeaway after the Camel Cup. Well, it turns out not long after their visit, Bradley Murdoch had visited the exact same Red Rooster to pick up some chicken for his dog, Jack. Murdoch was a handyman of sorts after all. He was a mechanic by day, so maybe he had a tiny invisible cut on his hand. He touched a chair, a bench somewhere in Red Rooster, and hours later, Joanne comes in and happens to brush against or lean on this speckle of blood. It's a pretty far-fetched theory, but I guess it's possible. Again, remembering this isn't my theory, it's from the documentary, so if you want more information, go watch it. We also have the pool of blood, where we can assume Peter was shot and killed. So there was no blood trail where his body should have been dragged, and no blood splatter from the gunshot. The crime thing really didn't make much sense at all according to one expert in the documentary, that is. Another point mentioned in the documentary relates to the CCTV footage. If we are to trust the expert used in the documentary, he tells us that the man in the CCTV was too short to have been Murdoch, who was a whopping six foot five inches tall. Someone hard to miss and hard to forget, I imagine. I just want to add in here as well, this documentary was pretty one-sided. It was pretty biased. So, again, watch it yourself, make your own decisions. Then we have the Jelly Man. Yes, the jelly man. <laughs> the driver of the road train that rescued Joanne, Vincent Miller, or Vince Miller, sorry, made some very interesting claims on or in the documentary. And these were claims that the public had not heard before. Vince said that on the night of Peter's disappearance, he saw a red car on the side of the road with two men inside, restraining a third man who Vince described as jelly-like. Interpret jelly man how you will, but I'm going to assume he meant like limp or lifeless. Vince said that the man quickly drove off before he could do anything about it, but in hindsight, he believes that 
Jellyman could have been Peter Falconio, but this was not the only strange thing that Vince saw that evening. In the distance, he saw headlights doing circles and going on and off in his words. He explains in the documentary that he told police what he witnessed, but he was pretty much dismissed and the sightings were never brought up during the trial. The documentary also puts forward a few other more far-fetched theories, including the idea that Peter Falconio, Peter Falconio is still alive today, which I personally just don't believe. Whatever happened out there that night in the NT, whatever the truth is, I just don't think that Peter ran away to start a new life. Anyway, those were just a few aspects of the documentary I thought were worth mentioning. But again, watch it for yourself, form your own opinion. And again, a reminder, I left out, oh my gosh, so much information in this case. This video could have been hours long if I allowed it to be, but I did do my best to compress it down to what I believed were the key points. But as I always do, I encourage you to do your own research. So do you think this case should be reopened or will be reopened? I don't personally think it will be reopened, but you'll have to let me know down below your thoughts on that because there is definitely a lot to process in today's case. And to round off this video, one last piece of information, Late last year, Murdoch was diagnosed with cancer. Some reports said it was terminal, but I'm really not sure. So if there's any chance that he is innocent, time may be running out for him. Not saying he is innocent, by the way, nobody come for me. <laughs> I have tried to present both sides of this case as fairly as I could, which believe me was hard as heck. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being here and listening to today's case listening to Peter and Joanne's story. Thank you so much to my channel members. You are all absolute stars. Follow me on my Instagram. That is my only active social media. I deleted my Twitter. Well, I have Twitter, but I deleted the app, so I'm not on there. I really should delete Twitter. But anyway, Instagram, Instagram. Wow, I really can't talk today. At underscore Samantha Melanie with no E on the end. I'll have it on the screen. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, all of that fun stuff. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon. Bye guys. That was weird. Bye guys. Bye guys. <laughs>